Awesome. Hey, well, it's, uh, it's great to see you. I want to thank you guys for being here. It's always a little awkward to start the service just because I love to actually watch you guys just hanging out with each other. So I feel bad even, you know, getting up here. But um, we're going to get started. So thank you guys so much for really engaging in conversation. Um, and this being a place where people don't just come and stand and um, hang out, but to actually do life together is a, an incredible thing. So it's great to be here, and we're thankful for those of you that are able to join us online for today's service as well. Um, you may not be here in person, but you're here with us. Uh, we're thinking about you, praying for you. And um, I've been out of commission for a few weeks. Um, thank you for all the support and prayers and meals that you guys have blessed us with um, as we welcomed in our third child, uh, Willow Catherine. So thank you guys. That's ridiculous. Um, you can clap for Carly when she comes here at some point. I'd, I'm just a helpless bystander, I think, at, at most points. But um, we're grateful, and uh, things are going well, and um, she says hello. Uh, it's going to be a little bit before she's here, but the time uh, will happen. So thank you again. Uh, we're, it, we've, we've been grateful of our experience here since we came uh, almost three and a half years ago. But I think um, in the seasons of life where we've just needed more from other people and you hate to ask for help, uh, you guys kind of come in, um, not just to our lives, but to each other's. We get to see that at work, and it's, it's the church. It's the family of God. Um, we're we're the, the small C church of, of this part of this community uh, on earth, uh, part of the global mission of Christ to make disciples. Um, and that starts with really, I think, the love that we have for one another, the love we have for Christ, and then we go. And so to experience that and to be able to say, hey, we have a, we have a community. Everybody's looking for that community to say we have that here at this church, you know, come and see, um, repent and believe, be baptized, but you'll be baptized into a family that's going to support you and love you. So from the bottom of our hearts, we're just, we're just thankful. And, and it makes me to see, uh, that it gives me great joy to see the way that you care uh, for each other, to know that that same care, I know it's going forth. I know it's not just here in these walls. So um, keep it up. And it's no small thing that you're doing. In fact, I, a lot of times I think that what I've just even just over the last three weeks to realize is the small things that we do consistently on a daily basis really are the big things. They, they lead up and they, they just fuel the fire of, of Christ's mission um, to reach and to seek and to save the lost. So thank you. Um, we're glad that you're here to, to do life together, to hear the revelation of scripture taught by Pastor Daniel. Would you please stand and let's uh, pray and praise together. Father, thank you so much for the revelation of your word. Um, thank you for an awesome church to, to receive uh, and a place to gather and to be connected to you. Thank you for your son. Uh, we have fallen short. We've missed the mark. We have sinned. You sent Jesus to cover that sin, to redeem uh, your children, and to give us eternal life. And we are forever grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stay standing. Let's worship the Lord together. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all make new we do to break 
the seal and open the scroll. The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he was saved his root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessings? Child. 
seat. I'm going to go ahead and pray for the kids going off to Children's Church. Heavenly Father, just pray for these little ones and their teachers. I pray that um, your word would just be just planted in their hearts and rooted deep. And we just ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, kids, you can run on off to Children's Church. Kim, you okay? Here, we have that. Well, good morning. Let me welcome you to Oak Bend today. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, we're glad that you've taken the time to be with us this morning. Uh, in just a moment, we will, we will um, look together at God's Word, but before we do that, I want us to do something else. Uh, I think we're all aware of what's going on in our world right now, particularly over in Europe with uh, Ukraine and its invasion by Russia. Um, and there are numbers of churches today, and we're going to be one of them, that uh, I want us to pray uh, for that country, those people, that place. Uh, there are many believers there, and so uh, they need wisdom about how to uh, deal with that, and um, uh, I think being Americans, we value freedom so highly that our hearts probably ought to break for those people. Um, and remember, too, there are people in Russia who don't want what's happening either, uh, so we need to be praying for that situation. I, I was telling in the first service, when you read the Bible, there's a couple of things in the Bible that uh, it talks about it being unchained. Uh, one of those is the Word of God. Uh, you can't stop the Word of God. It's, it's unchained. It's going to move. It's going to go. It's going to multiply. Uh, but the other thing we often forget about is our prayers. There are places we can't go, things we can't do. Uh, but once our prayers leave our mouths and our hearts, God is able to work in those and do that for sometimes a long, long time, or sometimes He works in them down the road and answers them. Uh, but they are unchained. And so I, maybe we often think of prayer as kind of last resort, but not really so. Uh, it is something we're called to do regularly, and uh, it is something that, that has have great power to it and a far-reaching effect. And so uh, we're going to do that today. Um, my hope is that you won't just listen to me pray, that you will pray. I know you're going to hear my voice. You can't help that. But I hope that you will pray with me. And so we're going to take a few moments here. I want you to join me. And, and let's pray for that situation and those people today. Heavenly Father, this morning we, we come before you as a part of your people, a people that stretch around this globe. And uh, Lord, we are reminded this morning where our help comes from. It comes from the maker of heaven and earth. So Father, today we pray, right here, we pray for uh, the people of Ukraine. We ask that you would protect them, we ask that you would watch over them and guard them with your peace, with your provisions, and with endurance, Father, for the moment that they are facing. We pray that those things which are evil, those plans which are evil, that not only would you oppose, but that, Lord, you would bring to an end. We pray that good would uh, overcome evil. We pray for your miraculous assistance for that country and for those people right now. Father, for our world leaders, including our own president, Mr. Biden, we pray and ask that you would be with them as they make very consequential decisions that will have far-reaching effects. We ask that you would give them your wisdom, you would give them courage, and you would surround them with godly voices and counsel that would speak into their ears at this moment. Father, we pray for courage and we pray for safety for the Christians and Christian workers there in Ukraine, the churches, the pastors, the believers. We ask that you would help them to know how they are to act and react at this time. We pray that you will help them to know how they, in the midst of very difficult circumstances, can still show Christ, his love his kingdom, and his salvation. And Father, I think of those in Russia who are not happy with what 
is happening at this moment, and some of them have spoken out, and they are suffering for that. We pray that you would watch over them, that you would strengthen them, and you would be with them. And Father, finally, we ask this morning what we all hopefully desire and should desire, and that is peace. Peace over there, peace around the world. And yet, Father, we realize that that comes in your Son. And so we pray that the gospel might go forth, and ultimately we pray for the return of Christ. We remind ourselves that we are to pray your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, we certainly ask for that today. And we ask it in the name of Jesus this morning. Amen and amen. And I would certainly encourage you to continue to pray for those people. Uh, Let me invite you this morning, if you've got your Bibles, I would uh, like for you to take them and turn with me to Luke's Gospel. Uh, Luke 17, and I have to say this morning, we're still in our series on uh, the soul. It's called Soul Searching. And uh, what we're going to touch on this morning, I I think, just has um, greater importance and weight in light of just what we prayed about and in light of um, considering what we have and enjoy as Americans uh, today. Uh, We live in relative peace and freedom and opportunities And so I think what we're going to talk about today um, maybe carries greater weight and importance than maybe it would have a week or two ago. Uh, This morning, we are looking at another of what we've termed spiritual disciplines. These are things that God has given us, God has called us to engage in that are for the care of our souls, the strength of our souls, the growth of our souls so that they are closer to God and they reflect God and uh, ultimately the way that we act, the way that we behave, the things that we do. And the one we're going to touch on this morning, uh, I think is a bit unique out of the ones that we've talked about or will talk about here in the last two weeks of this series, uh, because I find that very often when you read books about spiritual disciplines or hear teachings about it, this is not one that is often tagged, and yet it fills the pages of Scripture. And I think it's just essential for a good soul. Uh, And not only that, but it is something that right now we can use, unlike some of the others, to really get a measure about where we are in our souls, what direction our souls are trending. This will give us a good view of how we see ourselves before God. It will touch on whether we kind of live our lives with the sense that we are entitled to many things or much of what we have comes from a gracious gift and giving. And so uh, it is something also that I think whether we recognize it or not is a part of our everyday life and we have to make a choice about it. And that is the act or the spiritual discipline of being thankful, of giving thanks. It is not something that comes natural to us. You and I are not born thankful people. That is why you teach your kids when they are given something, now Johnny, what do you say? You need to say thank you. Uh, Paul even points this out in 2 Timothy 3 where he's uh, writing to Timothy and he's, he's marking out what the last days will look like. And the last days are from the resurrection to the ultimate return of Christ. And he lists a whole lot of things in there, many of them Uh, terrible. Uh, But one of the things that he lists that will mark the last days and marks an unregenerate people and world is this sin of being ungrateful, which gives you some idea of how big of a deal this is to God. And uh, just because we're redeemed does not necessarily mean we suddenly become thankful people. Remember the children of Israel? God redeems them out of Egypt with a mighty hand, 10 incredible plagues that God wrecks on the Egyptians. They see it, they're saved from it, and yet once they get out and in the desert, you're not hearing a lot of, thank you, God. You're hearing a lot of, God, I don't like this. We shouldn't be here. Why don't we go back to Egypt? It was a whole lot better there. Why are we just going to die out here? Just grumble, 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 complain, complain, complain. So just because you're redeemed uh, doesn't mean you'll necessarily be thankful. And uh, of course, 
the reality is there's plenty of things in life that happen to us that work against this biblical call for us to be and to express thankfulness, and yet that is exactly what we are called to do. Look at this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. We have it here to put up. Paul writes and says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You want to know what God's will is? Here's one thing that is God's will. It is that you give thanks. Uh, And notice the parameters there uh, in all circumstances. And perhaps this is a good time to remind us, being thankful does not mean you have to move into an alternative universe uh, where all you see is good things, and you know, even if it's bad, you, you talk about it like it's good. Uh, that's not what this verse says. It says give thanks in all circumstances. It does not say give thanks for all circumstances, and that is an important distinction that we really do need to keep in place. There are some things in life that are not good, for which we are not obligated to give thanks. Not everything in life is the will of God. There are other wills at work in this world. There is a conflict in this world going on, and sometimes other wills have their sway for a moment. Now, not ultimately, but for a moment, they have their way. So everything is not good, and we really should not talk or act that way. What we should do, though, is what it says here, is that in the midst of those moments, even when things are not good in my life, I need to find some things that God has done that are good. And part of the reason behind that is, is because Thanksgiving becomes a stabilizing, anchoring factor in my life when things are bad. Because when things get bad, I can quickly, quickly forget the good that God has done me, and I can just fall into despair and discouragement. And yet, in the midst of that, when I recall, yeah, God did this, yeah, God's done this, I I recall what he's done, I recall his past goodness to me, and I anchor myself to his character, which gives me the hope that though this isn't what I want it to be, this is not all there is. God is still at work. And so, that's why Paul writes that, and we need to keep that distinction. Well, we're going to look this morning at uh, Luke chapter 17, and it is there in Luke's gospel that he actually records a story, an incident that is all about the issue of thanksgiveness, so what I, or thanksgiving. So what I want to do is read it, and then I want to come back, and we're going to walk through a couple of uh, things, draw out of it for ourselves this morning. It's in Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice, He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. A couple things out of this story this morning. The first is I want us to think about and see the place of thankfulness in our lives. Uh, The setting here is 10 men who has what this text calls leprosy. Uh, Leprosy, that was just a word for any number of diseases of the skin, and they affected the skin in different ways from causing gross deformity to open infections and oozing sores, even to the point where uh, your digits, uh, fingers, toes, nose, would literally just rot and fall off. And that is what these men are living in. And to have a disease like this in that day was to suffer banishment. You were banished from any kind of social life, religious life, family life. You were basically sent away. You existed with groups of people just like you, and you were left there to die. 
And notice it says that Jesus is walking the border between Samaria and Galilee. That's kind of like no man's land where these people would live. And somewhere along that journey, these 10 men step out and from a distance call out. And somehow they've heard about Jesus and they want Jesus to have pity on them. And that is exactly what he does. His heart reaches out to these broken souls, broken bodies, and he tells them to turn and go to the priest where they would have gone to show themselves to be allowed back into society. And as they are going, all 10 of these men who are riddled with disease from head to toe suddenly become completely whole. But that's where your numbers start to break down. You get 10 out of 10 that are healed, but Luke makes it a point to say you only get one out of 10 that turn around and take a moment to express thankfulness. And note, note how Jesus responds to that. He says, we're not all 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner. There are only three places in the Bible where Jesus expresses a dumbfoundedness or an amazement to a human response that at least the Bible records for us in the Gospels. One of those is in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8 where Jesus is amazed at the faith of a Roman centurion who sends his slave to Jesus and says, look, I don't even need you to come to my house. I'm not even worthy that you come to my house, but I've heard about you and I know you have authority, so just speak the word and my servant will be made whole. And it says that Jesus was amazed at that expression of faith. Then in Mark chapter 6, you get Jesus back in his hometown where he grew up, Nazareth. They'd heard of the boy, They'd seen and heard things about him, and yet it says he was amazed at their lack of faith, and he could do very little miracles. And then there's Luke 17, where right here, the the emotion that comes out of these verses is amazement from Jesus at the lack of a moment for a person to turn around and come back and thank him for something that is so incredibly wonderful. I wonder, could Jesus ever be amazed at us for our lack of thankfulness? Considering all that has been done for us and that we enjoy every day. And did you ever wonder about the other nine? I mean, I, I, I think they all left happy. I mean, how could you not leave happy, been covered with leprosy, and suddenly you are clean, and you're going to be able to return to your family and life? I mean, you, you would be thrilled, and I'm going to take a good guess that I think inside they probably had gratitude for what occurred. They were thankful. They were no longer lepers, but they never expressed it. And it was that lack of expression that caught the attention of Jesus. It's not enough to simply feel gratitude, at least not from the biblical perspective. The biblical call is to express the gratitude in words of thanksgiving from our hearts for God's goodness to us. And Jesus shows us here by his response that the expression of thanks holds a really high place in his sight, but we also know from Scripture that it holds a high place in God's sight. Let me just run you through a couple. These are by no means all of them. We could be here for a long time, but I want to give you two from the old and two from the new that not only talk about the importance of thankfulness, but make it clear to us that it's something we're to express, not just feel. First Chronicles 16, 34 says, give thanks to God for he is good and his love endures forever. You need something to thank God for? Well, his love endures forever, even when you're having a great day or a lousy day, uh, when you've done really good and you're just kicking it spiritually or when you've just kind of bombed it. His love endures forever, and it says give thanks to God. Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. You know, all of us have a story to tell. It might not be as great as somebody else's story, but you have a story to tell about things that God has done for you. And the Bible says here, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Let them express thanks to God and praise to God for what he has done for them. Go over into the New Testament. Here's one that's pretty familiar to many of us. It's Philippians 4, verse 6. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So he never negates the fact that we have things to ask for and we want God to change things. That's the reality of the life we live and we will always want that. But he says, look, just in the midst of that, make sure that you drop some thanksgiving into there. And we're gonna see why again in a few minutes that is important for us. And then Hebrews 13, 15 says, through Jesus, therefore let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise or thanks, the fruit of our lips that openly professes his name. There is an expectation. There is a high priority placed on us expressing in words from our heart thanksgiving to God. And really, there should be because the Bible reminds us that every good and perfect gift in our life has its origins in God. You know, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, and I know we work hard and I know we do things, and I get that, but at the end of the day, it it really does trek back to God because your strength, your energy, your abilities, your giftings, your life ultimately comes from Him. And so what we're able to do, what we're able to accomplish, what we're able to have, whether we want to admit it or not, finds a line back to God. And therefore, there is this expectation and this high priority placed on recognizing that and making sure that we thank God for those things. So that is the place of thanksgiving. But there's a second thing here, and I want us to think about the power of thanksgiving, the transformative power that is in thanksgiving. In verse 14, it tells us that 10 men turned away and all 10 were healed. Right at that moment, just Jesus have compassion on us. Jesus doesn't say anything other than go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they turn and they start to walk away, they all become cleansed in their bodies. But then one turns back and notice how Jesus speaks to him, particularly verse 19. Notice what Jesus says to the one. Then he says to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now here's the thing. Wasn't he made well in verse 14? That's what the text says. The text says instantly. As soon as they turn to walk, there is a healing of their body. But then they turn around, this one does, and comes back, and Jesus adds this statement. Rise and go, your faith has made you well. I'd like to suggest that more than one thing happens here to this man. I would like to suggest that yes, he does experience an outward physical healing as the other nine do, but I would like to suggest that he experiences something that they don't, and that is an inward healing takes place in his life, what we might tend to call salvation or redemption. Because many times when people are redeemed, at least as Jesus interacts with them, this is the language he uses. Your faith has made you well. You've been redeemed, you've trusted, and you've been changed. And I would suggest to you that this man not only received physical healing, but from that experience and willingness to go and express thankfulness, there's a far more transformative work that comes into his life. And he is redeemed. He recognizes who Christ is. He believes through this work. And he is transformed not only within, but he is transformed without. He receives both. You know, when we give thanks to God, we we do what the will of God is. But what we sometimes don't realize is sometimes in doing the will of God, we get more than just doing the will of God. We get the things that come out of that. Because sometimes doing the will of God is hard. It is uncomfortable. It is not easy, 
But there is things that come on the back side of that that when we don't do the will of God, we miss. And I think Thanksgiving is really like that. The Bible lets us know that there are some other things that come with Thanksgiving other than just being simply obedient to God. Let me give you a couple of those this morning. We don't have them to put up. You can write them down if you want to. One thing, one transformative work that comes out of Thanksgiving is perspective. And we need sometimes a transformation in our perspective and how we see things and see God in the world. Uh, David, we see this a lot in his life in the Psalms, where he will open up a psalm and he will just be honest about how bad life is. And let's be honest, life can be bad sometimes. We shouldn't live and act and talk like it isn't. Life's hard sometimes. It's miserable sometimes. Things happen in our life that we can't figure out. They're unfair, at least from a human perspective. And David allows himself to say that to God. And yet, when you read some of these psalms, when you get to the end of the psalm, David is talking about the victory he has in God and how God, how great God is and how awesome God is. And this is just the God that a few verses back, he can't even figure out. What happens in between that? Well, some of those psalms you go and read, and in between the beginning and the end, you will find David praising God, thanking God for things that he's done in his life. And it gives him a perspective in the midst of the hardships about God. And sometimes if we don't give thanks, the only perspective we're going to have is the trouble and the difficulty. But in giving thanks to God doesn't always make the trouble and difficulty go away, but what it does do is it allows us to be reminded, oh wait, God's been at work in my life. God's done things. And I, I know what the character of God is like. And I know that while I can't figure this out right now, I know who he is and that this isn't all there is. And that helps us. That gives us a perspective we need. It also does something else. I, Thanksgiving enables us to grow in our trust with God. If you read the children of Israel, I mentioned that when the first group came out, all they did was out of Egypt, they just complained and murmured and complained and murmured and complained and murmured until Finally, you remember God gets them to the edge of the promised land and tells them to go in, and their response is a response of, I can't do that. And God says, that's fine, then you won't do it. And so you get 40 years to walk around in the desert, and that's as far as we're going until everybody over 20 years old dropped off. And then when you get to Joshua, you're you're at the second generation, and it's going to be their turn to give this thing a try. And it's worth noting that as the book of Deuteronomy closes out, which is words really to the second generation, it's, there's a lot of reminder in there of all the great things that God did, all the things he's done for them, even during those 40 years of walking around a circle. God still took care of them, still fed them. They just, unfortunately, that first generation did not get to where God really wanted them. Now it's number two's time. And it's worth noting that when they step in, they go in with a trust. And why? Because there's this reminder to them of what God has done before, and it bolsters their trust. Sometimes when we're in the midst of hard, difficult circumstances, here's the reality. You will not remember all the good that God has done. I don't know why, but somehow pressure, trouble, difficulties have a way of just sucking that out of our thoughts and our heart. And so we need this reminder in thanking God of things that he's done in ways that he's worked. And we'll talk about how we do that in a few minutes. It bolsters trust in our soul that he's worked for me before. I don't understand it, but I can have confidence that he'll work for me again. Here's the third thing it does. We've already kind of dropped on this a little bit earlier, and that is it is a, it is a means to peace. Paul in uh, Philippians says to mix your requests with thanksgiving. Now, let's face it. When you're praying about things, there's some things in life you don't like, you don't want. And, I, and that's, that's the way life is. But Paul reminds us that a means to peace is, is this thing called thanksgiving because it helps stabilize and anchor my soul to what God has done. And that's where I can rest. I can rest in the character of God because there's going to be times that bottom line is you just can't figure out God. He just, you just can't put it together. But I can look back, 
And I can remind myself of good things he's done and rest in that character. And that has a way of giving some peace to my soul. And here's the other thing, and I, I think we don't think of this as a blessing, but it really is. Uh, thankfulness helps me and keeps me dependent. Let me show me an independent, prideful person, and I will show you a person, by and large, that isn't thankful. Because thankfulness and pride don't fit together inside the same person, or at least one of them is not going to fit there given enough time. It's, you can't be proud and self sufficient and thankful. Thankful reminds you that it isn't you. It reminds you that the things you have and what you can do is more than just you, that somebody else has had a hand and a part in that. This is why Paul, when he writes to the Corinthian church who were proud, they, were, they really thought they were something. They thought they were great with the gifts and all of that. And Paul says, what is it you have that you didn't receive? And the answer to that is most likely nothing. Because in one sense, everything traces its way back to God. If we look hard enough. And listen to me, humility grows best in the garden of thankfulness. Because you remind yourself of your dependence. And that's really a great gift. To find yourself dependent on God. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, to the dependent to the one that knows they need something from him. So often in giving thanks to God, and even in the hard times of life, we do receive extra things from And there is a transformative power that exists within the discipline of thanksgiving. It can lead us to other things that we do need in our life and that sometimes don't come as clearly and as quickly as when we are people giving thanks to God. Which brings us to one more thing this morning, and that is I want us to think about how do we pursue Thanksgiving, because the heart of this story is the contrast that exists between the nine guys and the one guy, and the story is meant to do two things. It's one meant to make us consider where do we fall more often? Am I in the nine, or am I in the one? And I'm just going to confess right up front this morning, uh, I am not preaching on this because I'm good at this. I probably would fall in the nine. I'd be honest. Uh, I tend to see the glass half empty and the dot bigger than the big picture. And that's, uh, in our family, I'm the pessimist. My wife is the optimist. Um, And anything good with the kids is her and anything bad is me because it is, it is, that is my makeup and I know it. So when I look at this and I hear this, this is not easy for me. Uh, But here's the call. This story is here also because the goal is that all of us pursue the path of the one. That's what it's about. And the scripture tells us, it says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Why does David write that? Because we forget. Whether we want to admit it or not, we forget the benefits of God. And particularly in the hard moments of life, We forget. And so the goal here is to find a way to remember. So let me give you a couple things that you can think about that will help you and help me in being able to be more thankful people. One is this. You need a way of remembering. Okay, You're not going to be able to keep everything God does for you in your head. You're just not. So you need a way to remind yourself, oh, I remember when God did this. Do you have that way? Do you have a list? Do you have a notebook? Right now, how I do this is I have a file in my office. And in that office drawer is a file where I put some good things that God has done for me. Our nice notes, I don't keep bad notes, so our emails, so you send them. I don't have them. Um, I keep the good things that remind me how God has worked in my life or spoken to me or done something for somebody or some situation because of something I've been involved in. And that is a help to me to remember sometimes when there's just days I hate and days that are difficult. So we need a way of remembering. And it's worth noting, God's people, particularly in the Old Testament, do this all the time. 
They build altars. They set up stones. They make monuments. Why do they do that? They do that so when they cycle back around and they see it, oh, yeah, I need to remember that's what God did. That's why churches have liturgies and have things that they do. It's a way to remind them of God's work. And we need some of those in our life because we will not hold it in our head, particularly when things are difficult. Here's the second thing is I think we need to try to live with our eyes open. And what I mean by that is all of us are busy, crazy busy sometimes. And we can just move through life so fast. God does things sometimes that we don't even really recognize or take a moment to stop and say, oh, that's, that's what I had been thinking about or praying about, and there's God did it. It just gets by us and escapes us. So sometimes we've got to work to kind of slow life down and take a moment and just say, God, what are you doing? What, what have you done? At least something in the midst of all the stuff, is there anything God's done for you? Because we need to live, a lot of times we live with our eyes half shut. And what our eyes do see is unfortunately the difficulties. And they're there. I'm not trying to put them down, but sometimes that is all we see. Here's a third thing. I think we need to consider what we take in during our day. And yes, this is going to be my moment to uh, once again bomb social media. Um, I don't hate social media. I don't. I use it. But there is a lot of information flowing from that into our brains and into our heads and into our eyes, and a good portion of it is not helpful or encouraging. And many times, it's not giving us a very biblical perspective. We need, we need to have some time in our life where we, we make sure we're putting some Scripture into our lives, seeing who God is, what God says about himself, we need that reminder, particularly when things are tough, to be reminded of who God is, and that God does call us in the midst of life to find his work and be thankful for it. Um, so maybe we just need to sometimes shut down a little bit on one thing and open up and taking a little bit of something else better in to our souls and into our hearts and minds to see how God is working in the world. Because sometimes if you just watch certain things, you'd think God wasn't doing anything. But he is at work, and he's at work in his people across the world. The last thing is, I, I think, and I've mentioned this before, some of the things that we're talking about, you don't do all the time. This has to become a consistent habit in our lives. I think this is why Paul says, with prayer, with thanksgiving. Because I think Paul's ideal is that most of us the way he speaks of prayer is it's going to be something we do on a regular basis, and therefore he says, couple with it, Thanksgiving. Because if we only hit Thanksgiving a here and a there, we will probably not be very thankful people. If we're only waiting till that big moment pops out, oh yeah, there it is, thank you, we will probably struggle with Thanksgiving because there's many little things that happen that God does for which we can easily overlook his work. So it needs to be a consistent habit in our lives, even if it's just one little thing in the midst of all my prayers, God, from my heart, I thank you for this. You need to do it. I think that's the way we work this into our life. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, a preacher, uh, he, he did not have an easy life. He had a lot of health problems, church problems, and just problems. He once wrote, if God has heard our prayers, let's make sure he hears our praise. How true that is. The Bible is filled with questions. And one writer I read this week in reference to this passage and to this question that Jesus says here, where are the other nine? He says this might be the premier question in the Bible. And the reason for it is because every day we experience the grace of God. Whether you're a believer or not, you experience somehow the grace of God and he says, yet how many of us throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and thank him? And yet that's what we're called to do. And I will tell you, I, I don't know of any people with healthy souls who are not somewhere in their life thankful people. It, the two just go together. Thankfulness grows a healthy soul. 
So this morning, I just, I just want to ask you, where are you with thankfulness and with practicing it? And I know for some of us right now, it's not as easy as for others. I, I, I know that. Because you're dealing with some deep struggles and issues. But let's be reminded, God doesn't tell us to give thanks for all things. He just calls us to give thanks in all things. Find something somewhere that he has done for us. And may we grow in that grace and in that discipline. Father, this morning, Father, you in many ways grace and gift our life every day. I confess this morning, God, that some days are easier to see it than others. But your call is that we would be a people of thanksgiving. And so I ask this morning that you would help us to grow toward and become like this one who in all the busyness and stuff of life took a moment to turn around, come back, kneel at the feet of Jesus and say a heartfelt thank you for what had been done for him. May we grow in that in our lives, that our souls may grow more healthy. May we grow more mindful of the many gifts that we have each day from you. Father, I pray that for the health of our souls and the glory of your name. Amen. Would you stand and join us as we close this morning? Just how far we've come Knowing that for every step You were with us Kneeling on this battleground Seeing just how much we've done Knowing every victory Was your part in us Scars and struggles on the way But with joy our hearts can say
Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Hey, two reminders uh, for next Sunday. One is we're going to be taking communion together. So just a heads up on that, I would encourage you to prepare your heart. Uh, and things before you come in for that. And then next week, after the second service, we're going to have a potluck together. So we're going to just have some time of fellowship. We haven't done that in a while. So just a heads up on those. Uh, Let me pray for us this morning. Let me say, if you have something you need prayer for, I'd love to meet you up here and pray with you. Uh, Please allow me that privilege. Um, And so you can do that after we finish here this morning. Father, this morning, uh, we do thank you Uh, for your son. We thank you for his work at the cross. We thank you for his death, burial, and resurrection in which we find life and we find hope, not for just this life, but for the life to come. And so, Lord, we're not deserving of that. We've never earned that. It is a gift of God, and we thank you for it this morning as your people. As we walk out into the world this week, Uh, Would you help us to be a source of blessing, a source of your grace, your love, your peace to the people that we are around? Uh, Would you guide our words and our actions that they might not only please you, but they might show the kingdom of God to those who need it and to those that you want to bring into it? So, Father, go with us this week. Keep your hand over us in all things that we do. May we honor you. I pray that in Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us here and online. Have a great Sunday. Have a great week. God bless you.